This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Author You, your guide to book publishing. And as always, we share ahas, insights, and tips to enhance and support your book publishing journey. My goal is always to help you and your book to become successful. So as a reminder, if you're on Twitter, connect with me on at My Book Shepherd. And if on Facebook, join my book publishing group for news or questions or just to share your news and updates. And of course, you can always email me at Judith at Bryles.com. So let's get started. And our hour together is all about trends from book cover trends to ebook trends to everything in the world trends. And with us today is the amazing, awesome, award winning book cover interior design. And now she's an author, Rebecca Finkel. <laughs> and. <laughs> And Rebecca's been a guest many, 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 many times with us on the show. So I think we'll just kind of to jump in. In fact, Rebecca was with us on the Publishing at Sea Cruise. She has been part of the stable faculty member for many years. And, you know, Rebecca, what I love about the cruise is even though we say we're going to do this, this and this like a year in advance, that's always when we get together with all the attendees who signed up for it and we start chit-chatting with them. Like the night before class starts, we all decide to switch because their goals have changed since they originally signed up. Have you have you observed that? Oh, yes. COVID has put a, you know, the, the going into COVID, coming out of COVID, you know, wherever we are now, I think that has changed many, many things. It's been a huge impact on on books. Um, a lot more authors out there, a lot more people writing that had that book in the drawer, the idea in their head, so many more people being creative and getting their voices out. Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's talk about some of the things that you see. I mean, you've been designing books for how many gazillions of years? Yeah, 30 or so, <laughs> something <laughs> like that. Oh, my God. Everyone, we're all long in the tooth today. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we've been doing it a long time, which we have seen a lot, a lot evolve from from just how to write a book to how to design a book to how to publish a book to how to market a book. A lot has happened in three decades. It's actually stunning, oh, Rebecca. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I did a little bit of research on this, did some latest numbers, and you know, uh, you know, overall book trends, small bookstores are still dwindling. You know, do you remember Borders? It was, anyway, <laughs> Barnes, right? Sorry about that for any Borders <laughs> fans or employees. But Barnes & Noble is still making it, but they have switched over and do sell books. But they sell a lot of other things as well. They are they are trying to make it. Um, then they have opened up to, to getting uh, deliveries from Ingram Sparks so that they, you know, they're, they're not... They're trying not to compete head to head with Amazon because that's not a viable situation. Um, and COVID didn't help, although they really, you know, delivered. You know, they picked up, they dropped off, they did what they could. Um, there's an organization called Bookshop.org, which is increasingly uniting small bookstores. So if you think I need to have this book, be whatever it is, um, if you go to Bookshop.org and they can show you the the local. Um, small independent store, maybe in your town. They can, and the, I've had that book, my small independent store, deliver that book same day, deliver the book next day. They are really working hard to keep customers. Um, so, and although bookstore sales took a dip in 2020 and 2021, boy, in 2022, they are, people are flocking back to bookstores and they really want that print book. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a good trend to hear. I love the I love the print book, and print books will never go away. I mean, they have sixty five percent of the market on a super bad day. 
just oh, there the you women. know I, I I had a long discussion a friendly argument with my old old friend Don, Dan Pointer who is known as kind of like the godfather of self publishing and Dan is now passed but he when ebooks came along he was so charmed and enhanced by the whole thing he was convinced that print books would go away i was on the other side of the table saying there's no freaking way they're going to go away and that discussion with Dan was maybe 15 years ago when they first started you know dribbling in i can't remember when the the first amazon reader popped up i have, you know i don't know when that was, but he was really convinced that the eBooks would slaughter print sales and and take over the entire market. And in fact, that has not happened. The, the print sales yeah. are quite strong. And what's now encroaching on the same percentage of uh, of uh, uh, eBooks is the audiobooks. I mean, that's the one that's really come up. And I I think I think that if anything. People are going to be thanking COVID for that because people oh, yes. are outside walking with earbuds. Sure, I mean they can. Yes, and they can. You know, the whisper link between an audio and a and a and an ebook that's incredible. I mean, with COVID, you're you have just finished this novel, to you know, and you have loved it. And so authors mm-hmm. are marketing better. They're putting things in the back of the book, and you can get that next book right away. If it's an ebook. you don't have to wait for Amazon. So the you know, mm-hmm. e-books and audiobooks are even faster than Amazon if you need to have that book right away. Um, audiobooks have a little bit of uh, competition with podcasts. I heart, you know, I'm not dishing podcasts so that I'm on one, mm-hmm. but you know, that is kind of in the same neighborhood, those, those two people listening um, mm-hmm. to information. Mm-hmm. So, it is. Uh, you know, um, but what's really happened is that independent publishers have have just blossomed. Independent publishers, self publishers, have incredibly blossomed, up thirty seven percent, which is a huge rise in twenty twenty one. That's amazing. Um, mm-hmm. How many how many books are on the market right now? Which you know, I was Christmas shopping. So many good books. Oh my goodness, so many good books out right now. Hard to pick. Everybody in my family got lots of books because there's so many great ones. People are now you know. Putting putting more effort into it, maybe even slowing down and doing more, marketing more, putting things in the back of the book that lets your reader jump to the next book, jump to your next topic, join your reading list. Whew, so many things. Um, mm-hmm. I think with the comfort of Zoom, authors can now join a book club. I mean, you might have to get up at 3 in the morning to talk to somebody in Australia, but wow, you're talking to somebody in Australia about your book to readers who love you. That's an amazing thing. Well, I think that, you know, I'm glad you've talked about the global uh, Zooming book club effect. I can remember when I used to do book tours, you know, when my first books were coming, I did a lot of book tours. And some of the very best, (laughs) best discussions I had were at 2 a.m. in the morning. That the huge broadcast on a radio show, 2 a.m. in the morning, number one, you certainly didn't have to be dressed, that's for sure, um, on a radio show. But what a lot of people didn't understand is that these stations, um, in, in the middle of the night, the the broad reach for a, a major station is huge. Like, you know, you and I are based in Colorado, that I know that if I did an early morning show, that someone in Sacramento, California could be hearing me on typically what was a Colorado station, just because of all these airways start changing and there's less pollution out there. So um, don't don't shy away. I'm going to do anyway, Rebecca started the 3 a.m. in the morning in Australia. I, I think you have to be available for some of that stuff. So get your coffee and get awake. <laughs> and it's not every day. It's not going to be your, there every day. And they're not, you, know, you can say, like, I'm available for 20 minutes. And then, you know, go back to bed or do whatever, get on with your day. So it's, but that ability to reach your reader and talk to your reader, oh, that is gold. That is absolutely. It is is gold. So Rebecca mentioned bookshop.org that really uh, focuses and supports the indie book market and gets deliveries out to you or identifies a bookstore in a location. Another site I'm going to give you is indiebound.org, I-N-D-I-E, bound.org where you just put in your zip code and you just give them, you know, within the next 50 miles or hundred miles or whatever, they identify bookstores, any place that has a zip code. 
in that area. And that's a great tool. The other thing, Rebecca, that came up, we do uh, in-store book signings with Barnes and Noble. And um, they have a policy that if we run out of a book at a signing, we will get it in and ship it to you for free. Did you know that? That's incredible. Barnes and Noble yeah. has really stepped up with independent publishers. There mm-hmm. are, they haven't always had their open door policy, but that door is wide open right now and continues to be wide open. Yeah, yeah. We've had a great relationship. The Author You community has with them. All right, so um, eBooks. I actually looked it up when they first started off. Uh, 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 a, a computer geek by the name of last name of Hart. In 1971, came up with the first e-reader. E-book. Wow, that was <laughs> so like just... before the internet. That was actually before the internet. That's crazy. There you go. That's really crazy. <laughs> there you go. And of course, Amazon took off and ran with it. I, I think actually Amazon, although it built it, the, it, the, the authors were their backbone. Um, they they were the mid list. It started it was a bookstore, online bookstore, and then it built. But I think when they came along with the e-reader, that's when everything really started soaring for them. I may be wrong, but that's just my guess here. I mean, people, I, I've always, the way I think about Amazon is it's in a giant search engine. That's really what it is. It's it a is. giant search engine. You can misspell words. You can come in backwards. You can say, you know, whatever. You can be t- incredibly tangential to your information, and it finds what you're going for. That's Amazon. It finds that. But well, you know, the e-reader, mm-hmm. anyway, go ahead. I was going to say, when you say search engine, you all know, and we're coming right up to our, our first break here, but Amazon is the number three search engine. Did you know that? Number Google three. The first. Google one, YouTube, number two, YouTube. Amazon, <laughs> number three. Holy moly. We're going to be right back with this is Rebecca Finkel. We're talking book trends overall. We're going to get into covers in just a sec. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Is there a book in you? Or another? Author You shows you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being hoodwinked. If you already have a book out, you will find a supportive and brainstorming community that is connected and creative, no matter where you live. Author U brings in national experts for its book camps and annual Author U extravaganza. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author U's extensive network, Members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publishing. Author U is the premier authoring resource in the country, creating community, education, guidance, vision, and success for the serious author. If you want to create a book that has pizzazz, punch, and panache, Author U is for you. Timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted on its social media platforms, and it is free. Discover Author U, where authors go to become seriously successful. Join Author U today at authoru.org. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book. If you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. You know, Rebecca, you were talking about, I mean, we're talking about a lot of trends during this session. Um, But since we were into the e-world a little bit, is there anything you want to kiss on that or do you want to hold it off till later? Because that's, it's, you know, it's there. I know. My favorite line, my absolutely favorite line, Mm e-books don't have to be ugly. They just don't. They, 
They, yeah. uh, e-books do not, do not have to be ugly. Many of them are, and so it's kind of that unattractiveness that goes into the reading experience and readers are kind of turned off. Um, if you want to just dip your toe in the e-book water, um, you can check e-books out from your library. They, you know, they, there's a Kindle, of course, Amazon, of course, has a free Kindle app that can be downloaded to any platform, any device, anywhere. And you use that device to access the e-books. The library, any library will help you download it. It's almost, it's a, it's, it's pretty simple. The download of the app, you know, that's the normal download of the app. The library will fill that app, and then you open the app and open the book. It's kind of a, they make it fairly easy. But, you know, if you want to dip your toe in, check out a bunch of books at the library. You know, children's books, cookbooks, um, women's literature, men's literature, history, whatever genre kind of floats your boat. Um, and what happens is, after a set of period of time, and that's determined by the library, essentially it sucks the, the, the file back so you can't access it after like two weeks or three weeks or whatever mm -hmm. the checkout time is. It's kind of interesting. You don't have to run back to the library to return your books, um, although libraries are being really great about that. But check them out. I mean, you can, you know, it's it's a, not that much of an investment, and then you kind of understand where ebooks are different than print books. There's a lot mm -hmm. of things that happen in print books that can't happen in ebooks, although Ebooks can be in color. Color is free. As much color as you want, you can go overboard, but as much color as you want. <laughs> you know, do you want to put now the brakes I, on? Just tap the brakes right there. Yeah. And, you know, when you're on Amazon and going through, like we do, our, you know, every once in a while, we just finished an ebook um, bestseller campaign for Rox Berkey and Charles Brakefield for their Enigma Beyond. And that, right, right there on top, it says, that you know it was at zero so you could get it for free to download it um but also typically amazon has if you're in their prime program you have an unlimited resource of getting those and and when rebecca said you can just download it to your choice of platform which includes your laptop which includes oh, your i read it, off you my know, laptop computer yeah, that you can yeah it just download it straight and you have a you know your little folder that carries them all in there and that but I, I do want to put this caveat a lot of people don't realize that you don't buy an ebook you pay to rent an ebook at any time right. the platform you get it from can suck it back correct um, I've, and a I've been lot of people e don't realize that Right, and I've been reading ebooks for uh, for I don't know I I don't sleep well, so I get up in the middle of the night, and so I don't disturb my husband. I just read on my my reader. So I've been it's um, forever, but <laughs> I can't even remember the day I started it. But so I read, and I, I'm a voracious reader. I read two or three books a week. I know people do more, but that's my limit. Um, I've never had a book recalled ever. Mm -hmm. I have books that will update. They update invisibly. Like let's say. I'm reading a history book and the history updates in some way, or a cookbook and the cookbook updates in some way. Mm -hmm. It will the the ebook. Um, the next time I open that cookbook, the new cookbook file will open, and I will have all that additional information. There, it's, it's invisible Which is to very me. In cool. fact, I don't even. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I'm not even sure. Sometimes I get an, an email notice that says, "So this book updated," and I'm like, "Cool," um, mm -hmm. and so I can make a note of it and et cetera, and check try, try to check it out. But the ebook updates are invisible. Type of, um, situation it's and a huge plus. So all of you, when you right. do revisions of your books, or you go in and you correct it, and then you upload a new file, it already automatically shoots out to whoever has it. So when they open up their readers, it's there, which is I think Correct. very cool. You don't have to worry about that. But you know, going back to you've never had one. I actually did have several people get caught up in what was called Kobo Gate. And that there was a very sticky situation where somebody pushed the wrong button and screwed up. And there was kind of a, um, a, a quasi-erotic book that had the word daddies in it and went into all the children's books. Oh, no. And right. so, so those things happen. Anyway, the knee jerk right. was that all the platforms from Amazon to Kobo for whatever stripped off. And and they felt it was self-published. It was the self-published author's problems. And so they actually eliminated a massive amount of independent and self-published books until it settled down and got sorted out. It was horrible. 
It and was. With, you have to really yeah. watch your metadata on those things, and the, the metadata it fills for itself. So you kind of, you, you definitely, when I'm putting a book together, I definitely check that, uh, the metadata to make sure, it's, you know, a children's book doesn't have words that should not be there. There are any number of words that should not be there, but also um, just to kind of, I read the metadata just to make sure, yep, all those, that's that's what happened. <laughs> yep, history, well, Ukraine, well, everything. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this one had daddy in the title. <laughs> right, so I know. That it's, was it's, the problem. <clears throat> all right, so moving on. Anyway, moving so, on. yeah, moving on, coming back to uh, just trends in general. So the ebooks are, um, and I think, you know, still under overall 20%, my understanding of usage. Is that where you're at, or do you have a higher or lower number? I, I have a 25% in 2019. I mean, what people need to realize is um, the print book is not taking market share away from the ebook, and the print. Print, they, they don't mm-hmm. they don't necessarily compete. Sometimes you publish a book, and if it's not an ebook, people don't want it. It's just not their book. Although sometimes if you don't know the print book, that's not their book either. Essentially, you're doubling your market uh, presence if you have both. In a, and again, it, audio actually adds yet a bigger presence to the audience. So it's not like you are they're competing. You're not taking one away from the other. You're actually <clears throat> increasing and, and increasing your market presence and then market share and, you know, having the book available in several different ways. Um, Amazon has absolutely the corner on the market, which you'd expect like 65, yeah. 75% of all, mm-hmm. all e-books are sold through Amazon. Um, probably even more than that. I mean, they just absolutely have the corner of the market on that. Um, they started it. They should. It's it's a bit of an archaic system, but uh, they don't have competition to make it better. I mean, a car- archaic system on my side as far as loading and creating, there are some rules that you have to jump through. And it's, you know, um, I could go through them, but it's, it's that's kind of details. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> what I The best-selling ebook. Well, you know what the best-selling ebook is? You just take a guess. Take a guess. Best selling. Uh, book. T- t- oh God, it's got it. Maybe Harry Potter would be one of them. The, he certainly, he'd, he'd be up there. Let's see. Oh, it's got to be a a a big name. It's got to be a big name mystery thriller type author. Who is like it? a James Patterson or something like that? Something like uh, that. It's the Da Vinci uh, Code. It's the best oh, selling book Dan Brown forever. Yeah. Dan Brown. But actually, I I can go on Dan Brown on that book specifically. So many marketing incredibleness on that book. He was a wizard. But after that comes the Harry Potters, like individually, because and you have to think the Harry Potters are, re, are being read by any number of people, including a much younger generation of people. I've seen first graders reading Harry Potter, so mm-hmm. you know we are people are being comfortable with reading reading on an ebook or an e-device of some kind. So that's an interesting mm-hmm. thing to say in the future. I, I, I absolutely do not think print books are going away. I do not want print books going away. But I do mm-hmm. think it's an interesting thing. They also are listening to them. People listen when they work out. They listen when they walk. They listen when they, you know, anytime, commuting, in the car, et cetera. So mm-hmm. all these different ways to hear your voice, I think, is incredible. You know, so many different ways that you can get your voice out there if you are a writer. Judith mentioned I have a book, which is kind of a joke. Um, <laughs> it's it's I did a legacy. A book. We call those I did legacy book. books. <laughs> it's a legacy book. I have eight copies, and I bought all eight, and I unpublished it, and they're for my family. You know, I only did this for my family. It was the cheapest way to print the book, so that's what uh-huh. I did. And, I, you know, I used my own skills, so that was nice as well. Um, I wrote captions. That's my writing expertise. <laughs> 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 but, but, well, right, that's but, my writing expertise. Yeah, I, so. I, you know, I for one, um, print for me has always been my number one choice. I, I, because I, I love, I marvel at the creativeness of the designer. I, I love the way a book is laid out, designed. I like the feel of the cover. I mean, I, I touch books, and it was interesting when my grandson, oh, was like eight years old, and he wanted the entire set of Harry Potter books. Um, and I, and of course, grandma bought him that and that when he opened them up, he just looked at it very quietly, silently, and he spread them all out on the floor, all, you know, like a semicircle around him. And he went through and Rebecca, it was amazing. He touched, he touched, he almost smelled each book. He touched them. I smell books. What's the problem with that? Me too. (laughs) (laughs) What? Is there a problem? That's not supposed to be done? (laughs) <laughs> Why well, it seems reasonable to me. And so anyway, I, I love just watching him 
going through as he devoured each book, each cover, um, and that. And and then later that day, you know, when I, he was helping me set the table or do something, and he said, would you come over to, to my house and in my room help me set up my bookshelves like your library is? Is that not cool? That is very cool. That is incredibly cool. I mean, from a designer, I'm coming from a different perspective. I'm in awe of the idea. Authors give me these incredible ideas that I get to understand and poke with and find a cover that matches their idea. Oh my God. To me, that is the most incredible thing. I love that. I love ideas. I love poking with them. Many times I'll give an author like three or four cover ideas and they're like, yeah, (laughs) let's try again. (laughs) Like I didn't get there. I didn't get all the way there. I got half the way there, which that's so that's a for me that's cool that's very good sometimes i hit it out of the park get it the first time out not right, you know right. but a lot yeah, of times we, i'm reading we, with the author yeah, we've had a few of them another time i've got a few um but we, we've we've got one that had over 20 redos until we got it but you know right. it happens it yeah. happens and it's not like it's it's it, yes it is frustrating but it's more frustrating that i can't get this idea to settle i can't get their concept be what it needs to be to like shine or whatever, whatever word you want to say with that one. It's more of, you know, I'm, I'm getting closer and I'm getting closer, but I haven't quite hit it on the head. And, you know, <clears throat> not to throw some shame at you, but sometimes the title changes and sometimes the subtitle changes. And yeah, yeah so, you know, uh, sometimes it's a moving target, I guess is what I want to say. But yeah. I love the whole yeah. idea of kind of trying to, because a cover, you need the cover to ask questions. You need to, you know, you can't solve all the questions. If it's, a, let's say it's a thriller, you don't want to, you want to show when the guy dies or when they put handcuffs on the guy or when he disappears or when he's searching through whatever, like which part of that story do you want to tell on the cover? Cause you don't want to spoil the end. You want to just get to the point of like tension, the first point of tension, um, if that's possible. So it's, it's interesting how you play that. You want the cover to say, this is fascinating. I need to have this cover. I need and to have this book. Me up. I need to figure yes. out what's going on. Buy me. All right. With that said, we're going to take our next break. And Rebecca, I'd love to, <clears> when we come back, let's get into some of these cover trends. What what has changed? Yeah. And especially with Instagram and TikTok and all these other goodies that are in play now. This is Author You. We'll be right back. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Discover the power of you and your book at the Judith Bryles Unplugged events. Each summer, Judith Bryles Book Marketing Unplugged unfolds over three intensive days working with just Judith. You get publishing strategies, author and book platforms, book marketing panache and pizzazz, and authoring tools to take you and your book to rock star success. In the fall and winter, Judith Bryles Speaking Unplugged includes Judith as your coach and mentor during two powerful days. You will learn how to structure a speech, how to create openings and closings, how to find gigs that pay you and sell your books, and you will get one-on-one coaching. Go to thebookshepherd.com and click on the Events tab to learn how to participate at the next Unplugged Workshop event. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, with us is Rebecca Finkel. She is a multi, I mean a mega, mega multi award-winning book designer, cover designer. I'm thrilled that she has done 
um, had her fingers on many of my own personal books, as, and and she's often one of the go-to people I go to when we have new clients in to to do the brainstorming she was talking about at the last segment. Her website is FPGD, um, so that's like Frank, Paul, George, and David, right? Dot com. So FPGD.com and um, check it out because a lot of things are there that will help you. And if you want a book cover that you'll have no regrets about, Rebecca is the person to talk to. Okay, so let's talk about book covers and all the different things that evolved. And, you know, one of the one of the things, Rebecca, people say, so why did you leave New York? Because 18 of my books were with New York. And I said, you know, of a. In New York, I think that there was maybe two covers I really loved. Two covers that I really loved. I mean, they didn't care what my opinion was. But there was two covers of those 18 books I did with New York. So one of the reasons why I left is I want input. I want a little control of what I do um, and feel. So, uh, and, And I can say with what Rebecca does, you get the book you won't regret. So I'm just going to say it. All right. So Rebecca, let's talk about cover trends. What's going on? Well, just to, just to back up on that, I actually did get my start in books in New York City, uh, New York publishing houses, and there are a number of covers that I would design, and I'd be like, "Oh, this is fantastic! Look at this! Incredible!" Right? <laughs> you know, patting myself on the back, and then it would go through marketing, and <clears throat> I'd redesign it and take it down, take it I shift know. to left, take it away, and finally, when I got something, it was. It was, oh, the original one. I wish I could have shown that one. The other one that ended isn't horrible. It's actually good. But the one that we missed was fantastic. And the author, no no input. We get, you know, we'd have these meetings and we'd be like, okay, here's your cover. And next we're going to talk about blah, 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 blah. So with independent publishing, I've always enjoyed the back and forth with the authors. Always enjoyed. This is, you know, when I give them covers, I'm like, this is the start of a conversation. Let's talk about your book cover. And sometimes they look at me like, what? <laughs> but you know, <laughs> we do get there. So, doing research for this podcast, I was on Amazon. I'm like, this isn't good enough. So I went to my local Barnes and Noble, and I went to my local, my local independent bookstore, which is Firehouse Books in Fort Collins. And I walked around and kind of looked at all the books. You, for me, I'm really just very quickly looking at all of these books, looking at mm-hmm. the titles, and I found a lot of bright, flashy covers with bold sans serif type. Mm-hmm. A lot of times in all caps. So, the, mm-hmm. so to be bold in all caps on the cover means the titles are not, there are not many letters in the titles, not many long words, which I have a thing about long words and titles, we're mm-hmm. not going to get into that. But, you know, there are seven or eight word titles, which I can't tell an author to keep your title to seven or eight, you know, seven or eight letters per word because that makes a better title. That's not something that but that I can tell an author, but the big publishing houses can. They can come up with shorter titles. They can come up with a title that fits the cover better. What's happening is, There was a lot of flashy covers. There was a lot of flashy covers that had nothing to do with the interior of the book. They were all just eye candy. They all just wanted to get your attention. Mostly, they were, you know, in the theory behind that, I went back and Googled all of this stuff and found some ideas about this. And a lot of times what's being driven is this quick attention span driven and underscored by Instagram and TikTok that you have really flashy things get the attention on on these platforms. And so books are kind of taking that over as well. Um, there was like seven books I put in a row. Bookstores always kind of don't like when I come in because I rearrange their stock. Putting my books, <laughs> my books, on quotes, you can see me putting quote marks in the air, my books in front. But anyway, um, I put like seven books and they were all different genres, but the covers were very pink, very green, sans serif type, sometimes black, sometimes white, all caps, very, very, very similar. Um, so I'm a couple of the big houses in New York. I'm not going to, whatever. So a couple of the big houses. But it was interesting to me that I guess they felt they weren't competing because they weren't in the same genre, but they were competing. I mean, it's just the same over and over again, just the same. Um, marketing has taken over. It always takes over the, you know, the selling of the book. Even Judith and I have a thing about the book is not for the, you know, the book is for the reader. Um but mm-hmm. marketing has completely taken over the sell of the books. Um, <clears throat> the copies, you know, it's 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 distressing to me that so much of it is marketing. The author is so many steps away. Independent, uh, you know, independent authoring and independent publishing has 
really opened the door to authors having more of a say. Um, and just, I'm going to put a little pop in here. Even the big houses are are making you authors do more of the marketing. They're not going to. There's not a share to that. There's more. The share is more. 75, 25, with the author taking on 75% of that amount of work as far as building lists and making events and scheduling events and mm -hmm. scheduling that event in Australia at 3 a.m. in the morning to talk to your book club. Um, a number That's of my not going to happen. Have... Yeah. Well, let me, let me just really clarify. It's really more to like 90, 10. Um, that the only marketing that the New York houses do is for their, their frontier that first layer of authors, the big boys, really, the big boys and the big girls. Yeah, king. On, on the, yeah king you got to be, you got to be the king or queen here, and otherwise, their expectation is. I've actually seen in contracts, Rebecca, that 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 this they, their expectation is that you will take this advance and and purchase dedicate it to a publicist, marketing, all those things. They expect you to do that, and that's why authors today, and and, and whether you're traditionally published or you are with traditionally published, or you are with, um, uh, you, you know, you're doing your independent side, is you've got to learn marketing, and you better start learning it from the get-go. So that's that's where that stands today, anyway. And I don't see that changing at all. No, for an author to become an A-list author, which is interesting, you know, obviously mm -hmm. Stephen King gets older every year, like like the rest of us, right? So eventually mm -hmm. these A-list authors will retire or do whatever, and mm -hmm. they will stop being there, so they need more A-list authors. But to jump into that A-list author, you need to have any number of self-published books, any number of books under your name that you then you can quantify. I have this many followers and this many lists, and I put out, this is my workflow rate as far as putting books out. They're really not taking any chances on first-time mm -hmm. authors with not a mm -hmm. readership, with not a following. They are not taking mm -hmm. chances. One of the and authors that I follow yeah. um, has just jumped into a mid... She's always been self-published. and She's jumped into a mid-level um, publishing house and is thrilled, but they, she's like, but it's not enough. I still have to do the self-publishing thing because they're mm -hmm. only, they, only took this, they only took this book. I have 20 books out, but they took this book and maybe the next book in line after that one but I still have all these other books that they're not taking, so I still have to promote myself and prove that I am worthy of these other two books. It's the publishing houses are making it really difficult. I just, you know, I wonder it's, what happens in ten years or twenty years when Stephen King is no longer writing. Yeah, it's what a wake-up call. It, it, it's a wake-up call. Let me give a, a ta uh, an author you and I know well, Dom Testa. And Dom had started on the, the self-independent route years ago with his Galahad series. And, and you, look at the, you look at the original books, and you and I would both say, oh, yeah, that's self-published. But he did well with schools. You know, it was for, it was for middle school kids. He did really well. Um, and then um, I made a connection for him and introduced him to Tor Books. And they picked up all six of his books. When you said your author had 20, she had all six of his books for a lovely a piece of change. Um, and, and, and they moved along and they got Dom into the big library market and did stuff. But let me tell you, after, um, less than 10 years, Dom has taken all his books back and he is only doing independent publishing again. And why control quality, timing and money? Right. He, and he's, he actually, I, I designed a bunch of his books, and he has a number of genres out there. He's actually a very interesting yeah. person in that he can write in several different genres. But um, right. in his latest being the Eric Swan series, which right. is fascinating. Um, but um, yes, it's you know I don't I don't know where New York houses are going. It it doesn't make sense to me, but I'm sure it makes sense to them. It doesn't have to make sense to me. That's that's not the the idea. I mean. So just to kind of get back into cover design, because that's where I am incredible. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so talking about all these books that look the same, um, I would go into a bookstore. Amazon can do it, but bookstores, you just get so much information so much faster if you can, you know, take the time to go and walk in and spend some mm -hmm. time. Um, I always look at the other books in the genre, not because I want to copy them. I mean, what's the point of that, right? But I, and I don't, you know, that's not where I'm going, but I don't want to, accidentally design the same thing every else everybody else is designing. I can do that independently. Um, 
just because that's where the book leads. That's where it, well, that's why we're all there. That's where the book leads. But mm-hmm. you don't want to be the orange book in the sea of blue. Or you know, it, it, it's interesting. You do you do and you don't. But you don't want to be the same. But you don't want to be too far different either. That you want to kind of be in the same area. Um, See, so always I, to me, I'd <laughs> like to be the orange book in the sea of blue because my right, book will like first business. pop out right away. <laughs> Right, but that's like a business book. I mean, it depends on what your. It depends on your yeah. genre. It actually does depend on your genre. Yeah. If you want to stick out or you want to kind of hang with the hang with the crowd. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, I always. It's always good to do market research. It's always good to go out there and while you're doing that, pick up the books and see how many pages they are and see what the price is and get that information going because the price of a book is a completely different conversation, but always interesting. Um, mm-hmm. So <clears throat> there's also what happens with. Other trends that I found in book cover design is that a lot of times there's so many layers, which we've already talked about Rox Berkey and, and Charles Brakefield mm-hmm. about their series, the Enigma series. Those, those book covers that I designed for them are heavy, heavy, heavy layers. So many layers, layers of colors, layers of texture, layers of people and computer disks and all kinds of things that are in their books. So that, that I can attest to that. So many layers. So it, they become so rich. And the idea with that is not to make the book look busy, but make it look balanced. Make it, you know, all these different, what I call voices on the cover are all playing together instead of mm-hmm. somebody's on a different, singing a different song altogether. Um, so a lot of detail. They also have this idea where you have one photograph and you have like an extreme close-up or an extreme perspective. Um, that's also very popular to show these extreme um you know, this idea of the woman over the shoulder running away with a suitcase actually should be a genre all of itself. That type of a, you know, could be a bunch of <laughs> yes. things. That, yes. that whole thing, that, that's very popular. It is still very popular. And that picture book will be incredibly popular. But even that's becoming, the shot is from, like, you see her from the from aerial view, or you see her from the sidewalk, or you see her, you close up of the suitcase with her head far away. You're seeing a bunch of different takes on that very popular, cliched, cover woman over the shoulder with a suitcase um so we're looking for extremes we're not looking for the middle of the road which i think is interesting i love all that extreme stuff because not only do i love seeing it i love designing it so that's all very happy for me i love all that Mm -hmm. stuff well you know one of the exercises you do we're coming up for our final break is when you put up like those seven or eight book covers and you tell everyone in the audience they have seven seconds to pick the one that's the right one the one that pops the one that they you know pulls them in and people just don't realize how important it is to have that book cover that does the instant snag. With that, we're going to be right back. Rebecca Finkel of FPGD.com is our guest. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Are you confused about publishing options? Do you know which printing option is best for your book? Does your stomach flip when you think about selling books? Or do you feel overwhelmed with what to do about book marketing and publicity? Get the answers and much more. Get them and from someone who knows publishing inside and out from both the traditional and independent sides how to make a successful book. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so. Or you can create a book that looks and feels classy. Build your brand and platform and is a success, a bestseller. It is your choice. You choose. If you want author and publishing success, you want Judith Bryles as your book coach. Sign up for her weekly blogs and e-zine at thebookshepherd.com. The book shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and guide to collaborate with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You do not need more problems. You want solutions. 
Dr. Judith Riles will shepherd you through the maze and chaos. At times, she has had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher, by a publishing service provider, and sometimes even by the author. If you want author and book success, connect with her today at thebookshepherd.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. We're back with our final segment with Rebecca Finkel. And one of the things that I wanted to really loop back to um, uh, something she said when we first started off and we were talking about some cover things and some of the, the fonts that get used on them. And she referred several times to sans serif. And, and Rebecca, some people don't even know what that means. So how about okay. talking okay. about fonts? <laughs> okay. Technically, uh, sorry, but technically a serif is anything with what's called feet. So that serif at the end, you want to call it like a Times Roman or a Palatino, all have those like feet at the end. There's fins and there's six. And like I'm just thinking of a capital A has these little pieces of letter that extend at the base of the mm -hmm. A. Those are what the feet is the better way to say it. So a, that's a serif. Those are called serifs. So, and they have fins and six, like a capital O on the sides would have thicker than the tops. The tops would be much thinner. The sides would be thicker. So, um, every newspaper, I think, in the world, but maybe in the U.S., the big ones, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, any of, any of the big newspapers, all have serif type. We have learned how to read on serif type. That's, mm -hmm. that's why it's the most recognizable. Most books, newspapers, et cetera, have serif type. But, sans serif type, which means no serifs, where the, it's equal distance. So the A has a thick slab that comes down, no feet. It's just ends. Um, Helvetica is a good one. Ariel is a good one. Um, so many. There's so many of these that I love. My favorite, my personal favorite is Gotham. I'm a big Marvel fan, so it kind of rings a couple bells for me. Oh, but me Gotham too. Is one of my, me too. Right? I like right? Gotham. <laughs> um, so that's, those are the difference between the two. A lot of times if a type is going small and it's going on a textured background, I'll put it in a serif type because it's tough for the reader to read to distinguish those fins and six um, in the letter shapes. It's better if they're just all consistent and all the same. Um, I hate to be political on this, but Obama was the one that kind of started the OBAMA. His logo was all sans serif, and that really started the trend for all sans serif fonts. I don't, like I said, it's just interesting how, where these trends come from. He had basically nothing to do with it. Um, I'm sure somebody presented it to, and probably not even him, probably a staff, and they're like, yeah, that's the one. And they just, you know, he has nothing to do with it. It's just his campaigns that started it. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm so off track. Um, <laughs> but, you know, sans, the difference between serif and sans serif. I just want to put in a plug. I love working with authors. They are, they are so cool with their ideas. Sometimes, yes, I don't agree with your idea. It doesn't mean I don't want to understand it and figure it out. Um, you know, not everybody can agree with everything. I, I love, you know, helping them get a book out and then they get a book out and it does well and, you know, they sell copies or they win awards. And that's just incredibly, that's incredible for the author to, to have realized all of that, which I brought up awards. Yes, awards. Awards tell the reader that this book has been juried in some way and rises above the rest. Awards are important. Um, I, you know, I will give a, a book with an award a second look, see if it's, you know, if it's some prize that I don't know anything about, you know, it's like the neighborhood, um, the neighborhood bonanza award. I'd be like, huh, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I don't know anything about that award. But if it's another award, the Booker Award, it, any of these mm -hmm. other awards, I would look at it and and realize that yes, you know, this has been risen above the others in some way. So awards are important. Take a look at those. They can be for content as well as the visuals. Ebooks, audiobooks, the whole gamut, every piece of it mm -hmm. can be um, uh, awarded in some way. They're not mm -hmm. inexpensive. I wouldn't go crazy, but pick a couple, 
see how you do. I think, I think it makes sense. You know, I was while you were talking about um, Gotham, which is not in my standard thing because I wanted to do a comparison. I think it's a cool idea for all of you to just take a block, take like 10 lines and you can go even into your, um, you know, in your Word document and you can change each line a different font and look at the difference between the the serif and the sans serif. And I'm telling you, I believe that the sans serif is easier to read it as is. I look at this. It is. Much it's only easier be- on my eyeballs. Correct. It is absolutely. So that's why the titles of these books not only are pink, which is a big color now, not magenta and not soft pink, but like mid-tone pink, pink in these sans serif letters because you don't have time to digest the complexities of the cover. You have time just to like go over it. And those big, bold letters really work, really just... You can remember it. You can take a, a mind picture and remember it and, and read it. And it's very straightforward. It's only because the newspapers and magazines and most books have serif copies from the beginning of time. You know, I'm sure the, the when Moses came down with those tablets, he was putting in some, some serifs in those tablets. I'm pretty sure. But, but um, <laughs> Or sand. I'm sure he was. Okay, so. I'm sure he was. It wasn't sand serif. I'm sure he's taking that extra time and putting the feet in, um, those little serifs in. But, but we've learned how to read that way, and that's how we, we – Speed read. If we, it's tougher to read a condensed book like a book set in a sans serif. We actually trip over that. We actually, that's actually hard to read. But shorter blips and shorter, like titles and subtitles, et cetera. Sometimes words on the back of a book. Yeah, those are those are fine. Um, a business book I would never set in a sans serif type. That is not done. It's. I'm sorry. That needs to be sans serif. I mean, sorry. It needs to be serif. It needs to have feet. It needs to be like. Sorry, the like Moses and the mm. tablet. He was writing a business book right there, and he, you know, the serifs. Mm. Um, so anyway, that's sorry to get so far off. <laughs> um, you'll remember that <laughs> at that- least, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we have. All right, so that if you go back to um, so let, let's talk about the covers a little bit more. So yep. you know, how flashy do you get? You're talking about now we're talking like this pink. The pink that's coming into me is like fuchsia. Is it that bright? It's fuchsia and it's like the mid-tone happy pink. It's like, you know, I don't know, it's it's it doesn't have to be dark and it's definitely not that light, soft thing that's just, you know, blush or something. It's definitely a mid-tone pink. And then they couple it up with green or they couple it up with purple. They, you know, they're just, they're just looking for your attention. You know, it's, it's always, you know, I don't know, just looking for you to, to, to look at them and they, they want attention. It has not much to do with the interior, like really tangential. Um, and I'm really hoping this phase passes. I'm really hoping this trend passes. But if, you know, I do this, I do this seven second exercise with Judith that I take the, the top mm-hmm. 10 bestsellers. I just, you know, go in a day, take top 10, put them up in a line so you can see them. And I actually do this for myself sometimes, just as an experiment, and I see what pops. And it's fascinating to me that sometimes titles that you can, books that you cannot read the titles are like a number two New York Times bestseller. And I'm thinking, what? It's, you know, and it's not a Stephen King or a James Patterson or a Nora Roberts or a J.K. Rowling. It's, it's somebody that's more tend- a little bit less known than that, and the title is getting completely lost in the activity of the cover. I'm just thinking, well, okay, they must have promoted that one or something. The author must be doing incredible book reviews or incredible author things. I mean, you know, that must be why it is. Now, if I look back in a week or two later, it's no longer there. It's moved on. Um, so it's, it's you know, th- yes, if you have a name like Stephen King, um, you will sell a book without everybody even realizing what the title is. He has earned mm-hmm. that right. He has written so many books, and he has earned the right to just having followers that will just get his next book and gobble it up. Absolutely. Reader, you know, that's what that's actually what you're going for. That's actually the reader that you want. I do have authors that are actually not big names, but as soon as they write a book, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's mine. That's cool. That's I want to read that book. But it's not authors that are big names. I mean, Lucy Score, I'm not sure anybody's ever heard of that name, but that's one that I would, if she writes a book, I'm on it. Lee Childs, I love Lee Childs. Of course, he's now big with Reacher. But um, there's a couple other ones that when they write a book, I get it. I'm a, I'm a faithful follower. And those are the type of readers that you want, authors. Those are the type of readers that you want to find, encourage, you know, um, contact them, have a, have a, have a, blog, have a newsletter that reaches out to them. I have authors that reach out to me every week 
to with some sort of something about what they're doing. My next book is coming up. I just finished this book. It's an editorial. It's now in production. You should be on the bookshelves on um, this date. Here's an here's a little blurb. Um, many times at the end of a book, an author can have the next chapter of the next book. I also have authors who will take the characters and go one step further, which is not the next book. It's just an, like extra content. What happens in five years? What happens in ten years? Um, and they don't. It's not necessarily a spinoff to another book. It's just another twenty pages of these characters in that storyline that, you know, then that storyline's done. But I don't get that essentially extra piece until I'm included on their email list. Mm-hmm. Email lists are the Important. mecca. You yeah, it, it, yeah. Yeah, everyone, I I can't restate that for you. The most important asset is your email list, besides your intellect and your writing skills and your storytelling skills and all those things. But when it comes to website and and your assets, it's that's gold, and you really do want to build it because that's where, when Rebecca was referring to every time Stephen King comes, actually Stephen King is like the title of the book, but every time it comes out that they, oh, I don't have that cover, I'll buy that. That's what they do. They, oh, no, that looks different. I'll buy that one. Um, And that you want to build what you call super fans, people that will just devour anything that you come up with. All right, Rebecca, we have one more minute. Any closing thoughts here? I do. I just thought of one. So let's say you have a book out and it's kind of languishing and it's not doing so well. And you're like, ah, I want to redo the cover. And you want to redo the cover. That's actually, that's a great thing to do. And and it's not rewriting a book and it's fairly straightforward, et cetera. But let's update your cover. I would also update some sort of the interior, give them an extra chapter, polish up this, something, review the interior. So if the your same reader picks up the same book again, they're not going to get annoyed that they're reading the same book again, that they're getting some sort of a finesse, some different little thing. You know, um, I've, how many times have I picked up a book and been like, ah, they got me. I read this book before. This is, mm-hmm. you know, okay. But if I read, I've many, an author I'm working with now, Judith and I are both working with her. She has polished the books that have been out, added a little bit of conversation and context. Mm-hmm. And then when the reader picks it up again, they're satisfied. This is okay. I'm happy with this. It's so, better. They'll recognize it's, it's better. Right? You're, you've, in, you've improved since the last time you wrote that book. You're, mm-hmm. you know, your writing has improved. Your ideas have improved. The world has changed, and you can add some of that to your book. So I highly encourage not to just ditch the old books, but let's revamp them. Let's get a cover going and move forward. I, I, I couldn't have said that better. All right. Thank you, Rebecca, for being with us one more time. Um, right. And yeah, yeah, all of you, thanks for being with us today on the Author You, Your Guide to Book Publishing podcast. And, and make sure you review our podcast page. There's over 500 episodes that will take Thank you, you to another direction. You're welcome. Thank you for being a part of your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryle.